Hi, and welcome to this session about LoRa Basic Station. So, um, my name is Lawrence. I'm here with two other guests, uh, Anton Beidler and Chris Nair Eswaran. So, uh, Anton is from Centec. He's kind of the, the, the brains behind this LoRa Basics uh, station protocol developed by Semtech and, uh, and Krishna is working for the things industries is more working on the practical implementation on our network side network server side and uh, communicating with all the different gateway vendors um, to help out with the implementation of this protocol so without further ado I would like to give the word to Anton uh, to kick off this presentation okay Lawrence thanks a lot I'll start uh, sharing my screen here and uh, so in this presentation, basically, Krishna and I would like to talk about uh, LoRa Basic Station and in particular uh, focus on uh, its applicability in large scale deployments, right? So what are the problems that we have in large scale gateway deployments and uh, how can we use LoRa Basic Station to overcome those? So as for the agenda, we'll first do a quick introduction on uh, the, the concept of gateways in LoRa 1 and then touch on the basic station and its concepts and then Krishna will take over and give us some insight into how TTI is operating their large and diverse um, yeah, population of gateways. So in the context of LoRa 1 and here we see a depiction of a typical LoRa 1 stack, the gateway sits in between um, the LoRa 1 end device and the network server. So the lower one end device sends its uplinks with a lower modulated uh, um, frame. The, uh, the gateway listens to the spectrum and whenever a lower frame is detected, it will pick this up, it will demodulate it and forward it to the network server over some IP-based network. Um, the protocol is driven between the end device and the network server and the uh, cryptography, so the privacy of the actual payload is ensured between the end device and the whole application server. So the actual gateway does not keep any like per device state and it also does not participate in any lower one um, relevant cryptography. So in that sense, you can think of the gateway as a quite dumb device. It's relaying packets between the device and the network server. And uh, uh, as, as such, the, the, the firmware or the software running in this gateway is mainly uh, yeah, implementing two tasks. So in the uplink direction, it's decoding packets, it's filtering, maybe doing some filtering on the uplinks, and then buffering in case the uh, backhaul connection uh, suffers from intermittent connection loss. So in the downlink direction from the network server to the devices, it's basically managing the spectrum access for the network server. So whenever the network server schedules a downlink, um, yeah, the gateway looks if this slot is still uh, applicable, if, uh, if, if it can satisfy all the regional requirements and then put the actual frame on air. So this sounds quite simple and many people have done this over time, but there are some pain points that arise when you really deploy and start operate gateways at large scale. So here we talk thousands of gateways, right? And there, ideally, I mean, if you run these quantities of gateways, the gateway management tasks should be done from a centralized component without physical access to the gateway. Think of changing the LNS, so the lower network server um, uh, URL endpoint and its credentials, um, changing some radio parameters or the channel allocation, uh, the frequency allocations, um, or updating the firmware or even inspection or diagnostics of what's going on in the gateway. This should be uh, a remote operation and this should be, be able to do from a centralized component without physical access to the device. Um, on the other side, on the uh, backend side, when you run those large quantities of gateways, load balancing becomes an issue. An issue. You want to balance the um, yeah, large volume of uplinks between different nodes in your cluster. Uh, security and credentials management is, of course, key. You want to authenticate your, your large fleet of gateways to avoid denial of service. And time synchronization sometimes may be a pain point, but there the question arises whether time synchronization or timekeeping, in which level timekeeping and synchronization is actually needed for the gateway. And actually, we only need to do the bare minimum in that, in that regard. Basic station... Um, is an implementation of the gateway software 
that is um, providing base functionality to address these challenges that arise when you operate gateways at scale. So it's not uh, a simple packet forward in that sense. It has added features that address um, these challenges and provides base functionality to address them. So here we see a, a sort of an architecture diagram how the basic station software fits into this picture. If we read, re, uh, read this from left to right, uh, we have the uh, antenna and the radio front at the hardware on the very left of this picture. And over SPI, this hardware is driven by some host platform. This host platform in most cases is some Linux-based um, system, but we clearly see a trend towards miniaturization there as well. And more and more gateways uh, come into play where the base system is actually a, a tiny real-time OS with very little le resources. So the basic station is uh, software that runs on this uh, on this operating system and uh, communicates via the uh, lower gateway uh, hell library, uh, also su uh, supported and supplied by Semtech over SPI to the to the hardware. Towards the other end, so northbound towards the network server side, Basic Station implements two protocols. The CAPS protocol is the configuration part and the bring up part of uh, uh, the Basic Station software. So it's a protocol that allows to exchange credentials and LNS endpoint information, but also information that's relevant for firmware updates. The uh, LNS protocol, the lower network server protocol, is what's actually uh, delivering the uplinks and receiving the downlinks in order, order to actually drive the com uh, lower run communication. So basic station comprises is basically comprised of, of the software implementation and the definition of those two protocols. And I invite you to go to this GitHub repository. It's an open source project. Um, and this also links to the, uh, the protocol definition. The software itself is written uh, in, a, in a portable way, to, uh, meant to be very lean and uh, implemented in, in the C language with very little dependencies. This allows actually software to be uh, yeah, implemented and ported on, on yeah, large Linux-based gateways as well as on tiny real-time OS-based gateways, uh, which are based on an embedded system. The backend protocols yeah, mean to facilitate those uh, the space functionality needed to address the challenges that we just uh, iterated. So, and how exactly they do, uh, this is sort of uh, what I would like to touch on here by explaining these two protocols in a bit more detail. So the CAPS protocol, as I said, is its purpose is to configure the LNS end endpoint and help to distribute uh, firmware updates securely. So it's basically just an HTTP call, nothing else. And uh, it's invoked either periodically or during startup by the gateway. The lower basic station uh, network server protocol is uh, the actual data pipe between the LNS and the gateway, and it's implemented as JSON records over a WebSocket uh, connection. Uh, and it features uh, first a handshake sequence uh, for service discovery, which addresses the load balancing aspect and also uh, receives the radio configuration over this uh, protocol. So the CUPS protocol in a bit more detail here. So we see the flowchart, the station, uh, will invoke an HTTP POST request on the CUPS backend service with a JSON formed uh, uh, a packet that contains its current state. The response is an octet stream and out of that station will parse the update credentials for, for the CUPS uh, endpoint, for the LNS endpoint, reconfigure its credentials accordingly and look whether or not uh, some executable is also part of that uh, uh, response will ver verify the signature and then execute this blob that is contained there. So the actual firmware update or whatever you call it, this executable blob is actually quite opaque to the protocol. It's just some executable which needs to be signed properly. And when the signature verifies, uh, then the execution takes place. On the LNS protocol side, uh, yeah, so station starts off to connect to the configured endpoint using its credentials and advertising itself, its version and uh, its uh, parts of it, subsets of its features. The LNS discovery endpoint, so this logical endpoint on the other side, so this backend component will receive this request and respond with an URI endpoint to which station then connects in the next phase. In the next phase, station will connect there 
advertise itself again. And the response this time is the actual configuration of the radio front end. So the channel allocations. The radio is started up and from that time on you're in a steady state where uplink messages are being forwarded to the network server and downlink messages are being received and scheduled on air. So this is designed for low latency. The security is done over TLS and the features like time synchronization, health reporting and remote shell, things like that that uh, help you to do a centralized monitoring of your gateways is done over this protocol. So in terms of security, I think we're quite industry standard here, yeah, relying on TLS and X509 certificate authentication on the client and on the server side. On the client side, you have the option to do HTTP token authentication and the firmware update is signed using ECDSA. So in general, um, if you design your own PKI, you should preferably rely on elliptic curve cryptography. This gives smaller keys. And also um, features like fragment size negotiation extension for TLS should be used to just facilitate it in the future. You might find yourself in a situation where you want to connect a large scale of gateways, which happen to be very uh, uh, small platforms and uh, resource restricted platforms. Those platforms will rely on those features to uh, implement their functionality and their security. So if we come back to those challenges, uh, I think it becomes clear that Basic Station is uh, providing base functionality, is addressing those uh, those pain points here with a centralized gateway management facility over over the CUPS and the TLS protocols, load balancing built into the TLS protocol, security and time synchronization also driven over the LNS protocol to facilitate all that. Yeah, and with this, I turn over to Krishna. Thanks a lot. So now I'm going to give you the network service perspective of managing gateways. This includes an overview of different packet forwarders, how the Things Enterprise stack handles these different packet forwarders, real, some real world statistics on handling uh, large scale deployments from the Things Network public community network, and some challenges that we faced while handling these gateways and how we solved those challenges. So this slide lists some of the most commonly used open source packet forwarders. The Semtech UDP forwarder being the most common amongst them. Almost all gateway vendors have at least one variant that supports this forwarder. Uh, there's also the multi-purpose packet forwarder, which is a community contribution from Yak Cursing. It runs the MQT, it runs on the MQTT protocol uh, and is actually quite a good alternative to the Semtech UDP forwarder. There was also for a short while the TTN packet forwarder, which has now been discontinued, which you saw on the GRPC protocol. Uh, and of course, Andon spoke to you at length about the Semtech Basic Station uh, packet folder, which runs on WebSocket. So this is a slide that Andon showed you and as part of his presentation. Uh, the thing that I want you to focus here is that the network server has the challenge of handling not only gateways of different uh, protocols, but also different types of upstreams which uh, are the sources of downstream messages. What that means is that these generic blocks that are labeled application server here are all not unique. They, are of di they have different purposes and hence uh, the, the network needs to be able to handle both complex gateway protocols but also applications uh, simultaneously. As many of you know, the Things Enterprise stack uh, or the Things stack and its enterprise variant, the Things Enterprise stack is a LoRaWAN network server uh, implementation. Compared to the generic image that I showed you earlier, there are uh, different uh, components here, but we will, we are going to focus mainly on the gateway server because that is what handles gateways. Um, this is uh, the gateway server is a component of the Things Enterprise stack. We run it as a microservice. It's responsible for managing gateways. Um, it provides native support for all the open source protocols that I mentioned so far, uh, and it's quite good at managing bidirectional streams. Uh, when it comes to gateways and also to to uh, to the different types of upstreams. So this is sort of a zoomed in uh, view of the gateway server architecture. So we have protocol specific frontends and protocol agnostic upstreams. So frontends are specific to protocols. We have one uh, implementation of uh, the handling of different protocols for each types of uh, packet forwarders. So tomorrow, if there was a new type of packet forwarder, it would be easy for us to extend this implementation to support that also. 
and there are also different types of upstreams which are the recipients of uplink messages and the sources of downlink messages so the separation of the front end and the and the upstreams make sure that we are able to cater to different needs on both the gateway side and on the application side so in order to understand the complexity of what the gateway server is handling let's take an example so um, let's assume that there is a device which is in the range of two different gateways and these two different gateways run on different protocols. So as the nature of LoRaWAN, the devices receive messages, devices send messages which are received by multiple gateways and a copy of this message is received by two different gateways. So in this case, let's say you have a UDP uh, gateway and an MQTT gateway that receives the same message. Now what's important to, to note is that the message format in which uh, uh, the, the network receives uh, a, UD, a message from a UDP gateway is different from uh, the format in which an MQTT message is received. So uh, the, the protocol specific frontends convert these messages into a generic uplink message, which uh, the rest of the network can understand. And this is then routed to the corresponding uh, upstream. So in this case, at the network server, it could also go through the packet broker or to any custom uh, backend that requires this message. Uh, now the network server, of course, deduplicates these messages. It's the it's in the lower one layer, and it's a responsibility of uh, the the network server. And let's assume that this is a join re request, and this has been accepted. So then the join accept is sent back to the device via a downlink. Um, and now the the downlink which originates from one of these upstreams, in this case the network server, for example, has to be routed to the device uh, by the best possible path. And the important thing to note here is that uh, you cannot send two copies of the same downlink message. So the gateway server has to choose which of the two gateways that it received the uplink from is the best to send this downlink to. Uh, it makes this calculation based on SNR, RSSI uh, and some other factors. And then the front end will translate the generic downlink message, which is handled, uh, which is used in the network side to the protocol specific downlink message of the MQTT uh, protocol uh, side. So just to recap, the, the gateway server actually helps uh, in good separation of gateways and upstreams because of its modular architecture. Since you have specific frontends which handle uh, protocol specific uh, messages, the, the complexity is handled per protocol in the frontend. So it's very easy to extend uh, if there is a new uh, type of protocol. And it's n cross n scalable, which means that uh, one gateway server can connect to n uh, upstreams as shown here. And it's also possible that one upstream can connect to n gateway servers, which also helps in sort of front end load balancing. Uh, now we come to some interesting uh, statistics that I pulled up from our public community network. As you know, the Things Network Foundation runs four clusters in one in US West, one in Europe, Asia and Brazil. And this is sort of a breakdown of different gateways per protocol uh, aggregated over the last week, more or less. Um, I've neglected the gRPC gateways here and I've also not included the partner managed networks. So as you can see, the UDP gateway is the most commonly used of all gateways. Um, and you also have the MQTT and basic station sort of catching up. Uh, the interesting thing to note here is that, especially in Europe, the volume of gateways is quite high the European cluster contributes to almost 80% of our gateways, which means that the European uh, cluster has to handle a huge volume of traffic. And this, um, as I told you before, can cause problems uh, since there are almost 8,000 gateways connected to the single cluster uh, in Europe. So based on our experience in handling large volumes of gateways, uh, there are certain issues coming with, with respect to certain protocols. So for example, in UDP, because of the nature of UDP communication, there's no persistent connections. Since there's no persistent connection between a gateway and uh, the front end, uh, it's possible that there are multiple connections. You can sort of solve this by authentication, but that has to be implemented separately and it's not a part of the protocol. So which means that it's quite easy to spoof messages uh, on the UDP protocol. There's also It's also quite difficult to get uh, connection statistics accurately because since there is no concept of a connection between the gateway and, and the front end, um, the, the, the concept of connection has to be handled on an application level. 
Uh, and this can get really complex when there are many gateways. Also, stickiness is quite, quite complicated. What that means is that uh, if there are multi, as I said, the gateway server is n cross n uh, scalable, which means if you have n gateway servers, uh, different messages from the same gateway can be routed to the backend via different uh, gateway servers. And it's quite complex to handle the stickiness between uh, a, a, the, a gateway and a particular instance of the gateway server. And in order to make the system secure, we need some, some, some sort of firewall. Uh, and this makes for a very complicated firewall logic. So uh, in the Things Enterprise stack and the Things stack, we have quite a complicated uh, logic to handle all of these issues. Um, the protocol itself does not help in solving any of these problems. And a lot of these are actually solved uh, in the basic session protocol. But the base, based on our experience, the basic session protocol also has uh, some drawbacks in the sense that since it's a TCP based, uh, WebSocket is TCP based, if the client disconnects uh, without sending a TCP fin, pack, fin packet, uh, it's considered as an unclean disconnection, which means that the client has disconnected, but the server does not know. Um, this happens quite often with some commercial load balancers, uh, which maintain the connection between the load balancer and the upstream, but do not indicate that the gateway has broken gateway connection has broken. So if this gateway uh, reconnects and the existing and the, and the connection is still persistent, then the connection state gets corrupted and you have problems of this gateway connecting to the to the gateway server. So um, this can be solved either by using some form of custom application layer handling, which we do. Uh, it can also be solved by using uh, some commercial load balancers, which actually make sure that the upstream, the connection between the load balancer and the and the gateway server get disconnected when the client disconnects. So this is something to bear in mind if you if you um, have a large deployment of uh, either of these gateways. And finally, here's a list of some resources that you can use to get started with uh, experimenting with the basic station. So for the gateway side, uh, you have the documentation and also the open source repository for basic station uh, available here. And for the server, you can either set up the entire things stack from scratch um, from our GitHub page, or you, there's also documentation for that in the link below. Or if you want to just try out uh, the services without having to set up everything, then you can go to this link, ttc.e1 or nam1, um, and create a free tenant and try it out. Uh, so now it's time for some questions. So thanks a lot for your presentation, Anton and Krishna. Uh, this is very, very useful. Um, so I have a few questions myself. Uh, we have about seven minutes for questions and then, then I'll ask some questions posted by the chat. Um, I think let's start off with basically looking into like where we are now. So um, you showed us that there are 1380 gateways that run basic station as of now on the things network. So what kind of gateways are these, Krishna? Uh, most of them are the, the things indoor gateway, the little uh, gateways that we gave away at the conference. Uh, those have been in quite high demand. We also have some custom uh, gateways built on the Raspberry Pi, also connected to, to the things network. Okay. Uh, I think we, we've seen a presentation from uh, Wifix before, and they also showed basic stations. So as far as I know, they also did this full implementation. So like, like what other gateway brands or companies did already implement this protocol? Oh, we've been working with almost every reputable gateway brand, uh, Multitech, Curlink, Cisco, um, Ursalink, everybody that we know uh, implements this protocol now. Most, most gateways are still in pre-testing and quality assessment. Uh, we very soon we, they will have commercial um, commercial variants of this gateway, of this protocol. Right. So uh, I think most of the work, if I understand it correctly, that is done basically on your side as well as on the side of the gateway provider. So what is actually needed for the like the the users or the integrators themselves to implement this protocol? Yeah, I think. I think adoption um, in that regard is always a tough question, right? So there must be some uh, some convincing argument for people to take over uh, something new, right? That has not been there before and it has to prove itself. So I think that's uh, the phase in which we are in right now. And I think uh, people more and more start to understand, uh, 
yeah, the problems that are trying to be addressed with basic station, with the different protocols. There's particular value in, uh, in automating management tasks, in centralizing management tasks, and, uh, and, and uh, automated bring, bring up. So if you think of deployment uh, of uh, uh, tiny gateways across, across a large uh, campus, you don't want to touch every single one of them. You just want to place them somewhere and then they start up and they connect to the right place using correct credentials in a secure fashion. So this is what we are facilitating here. And the more people that have actually those use cases, I think they will start to understand the value of it and, and also ask for it and adoption will rise. That's my expectation, my hope at least. Yeah, 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 and it's clear. So I actually mainly interesting in one specific feature. So let's let's first um, touch on that topic, which is the remote access and update part. Um, because at least it's my experience, and I can imagine that it's more that people have more experience with that. That for some reason the gateway goes down, uh, firmware needs to be updated, um, the network server has to be need to be changed from the things network to the things industries. Let's say. And as of now, I've been then going to the gateway, connecting either physically with my laptop or like SSH into the gateway remotely. So maybe you can explain a bit on like what's what's kind of the, the process of um, yeah, remote, getting remote, remote access and, and, and updating firmware remote. I think I can touch on that in a general terms and then maybe Krishna can uh, also comment on how this is done in practice maybe. Uh, so for exactly for these purposes, uh, the CAPS protocol is designed to, uh, to uh, transport new credentials and new configuration in terms of LNS connectivity uh, down to the gateway. So in uh, regular intervals, the gateway will um, do an, a CAPS request, an HTTP request to the CAPS backend, advertise its uh, configuration, and will receive new configuration if there is a new configuration for that gateway. So you have a centralized component that takes care of all of this, uh, where you have a centralized uh, database where you configure the state you want your device population to be in, and over time, your device population will merge into that state. So you can uh, update the, uh, the, the, the gateway to go to a different CUP server, you can update it to go to a different LNS, you can up, um, and transport to the gateway an executable blob, a signed executable blob, which will actually perform whatever task you want. So it can either be a firmware update, but it, it can also be a hot patch just doing something. It's just an signed executable blob that uh, yeah, is being executed on the platform. So, and I believe that the, these three sort of uh, functionalities, they don't cover the entirety of your gateway management use cases, but they provide, I think, quite quite uh, useful means to implement very many of those use cases using this protocol. Yeah, clear. And, and CUPS stands for configuration and update. Sure. Well, it can also be understood as, uh, as the <laughs> printing protocol that was introduced, of course, in the Unix world. But there we have this overlap, but yeah, CAPS is a configuration update uh, service, yeah. So, Krishna, how, how would it work then in practice? So, I have this new firmware ready. Do I need to log in the console, like uh, open my terminal? Like, how does it work? Yeah, so the idea is that there's, um, there's some sort of a firmware repository. I think we also do something similar with the, the Kickstarter gateway, the ones that, the, the square ones. They also have a similar idea is that you have a, a firmware update location somewhere. And uh, we send down to the gateway the location or the or the the um, CRC of the new binary to, for it to pick up from, uh, and the gateway will on the next update will automatically know that a new hash is available. Go to that location and pick up the new binary itself. So it's as easy as just changing the configuration to point to a different uh, binary location. And since this, these binaries are signed, you cannot have unsigned binaries. So it's quite difficult to hack it and install a, a custom binary, for example. Yeah. And, and and so you basically first get access to this gateway and then you do this like this kind of remote secure sh shell through this gateway and then you point basically to a new update address to pull the new firmware. No, you don't have to shell at all. Uh, you, it's just a part of the configuration. So the firmware, uh, the location of the firmware, or the CSC of the firmware is part of the configuration. All you have to do is just update that on the console or in, the, in a server somewhere. And the next time the gateway uh, checks this configuration server, it picks up the new configuration and automatically uh, pulls the new firmware. 
Perfect. Okay. Clear, I think it's very interesting, but unfortunately, it's, we already hit the time. So I would say if you have further questions, I would like to ask you to stay a bit more in the chat to answer a more, few more questions that people might have. Um, and um, we are going to go to a new session. And actually, for this, we're going to open up a new YouTube stream. So you basically can go to the basics um, YouTube channel from the Things Network, and there you find the updated. Uh, channel. So thanks a lot again and uh, wishing you all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye.